Minnie is suggesting that family hatchback buyers wanting something a little different at the upper end of the Focus and Golf segment should go with their gut and choose this second generation Clubman model. Drawing inspiration from the Mini Estates of the 1960s, it's the most accessible car the brand has ever produced, and also the largest. Innovative twin rear doors add a dash of uniqueness too. Mini has never really gone mainstream. To date, the brand's BMW Air products have been stylish, quite upmarket, but a little different. Here, though, is where that policy starts to change. This second-generation club model, launched here in 2015, is the company's first serious attempt at a volume market segment, in this case, that for focus-class family hatchbacks. It's a very significant car. If you happen to be familiar with the previous modern era Clubman, which sold for seven years from 2007, you'll see immediately this is a much more serious and credible piece of design. Where that original model was effectively a stretched super mini estate with a silly single side door that forced you to stand in the middle of the road to get your kids out, this car has grown up and stopped messing around. In terms of size, price, practicality and performance, it seems directly comparable to that Golf 4 Focus you might have been thinking about. Yet it claims to deliver sense and sensibility with more than a dash of mini joie de vivre. If at this point you're thinking that you've heard this kind of claim before from this brand, then you're right, you have. In 2010, the company launched its very first slightly larger model, the five-door Countryman, a car that Mini eventually ended up targeting at the growing crossover segment, as the original version wasn't quite big enough to compete head-on with conventional family hatchbacks. A slightly more compact stab at the five-door body style was provided by the Mini five-door hatch that was launched here in the autumn of 2014, and has since proved to be a credible car, provided your point of comparison is with similarly configured Super Minis. You've got the idea then. The concept of a slightly more spacious Mini is nothing new, but the delivery of one with the practicality and sophistication to directly take on the Focus fraternity very definitely is. This Clubman model can offer this because BMW itself has also entered this market with its 2 Series Active Tourer, the company's first front-driven design. And the two cars share the same engines and underpinnings, which means that Clubman buyers will get more sophisticated mechanicals than they might expect from a Mini, an engine as large as 2 litres in size, for example, in the Volume Cooper D diesel variant that we're trying here, and the option of an automatic gearbox with as many as 8 speeds. Of course, this Clubman tries to retain its own individual appeal, most notably through a unique twin-door tailgate that rather irrelevantly positions it as the market's very first six-door car. Overall, it's a model that aims to open up the mini-adventure to more people than ever before. Does it make sense, though? Time to find out. So, what's it like on the road? A little different from the Mini norm is the answer, but thankfully not too different. As a brand, Mini has long struggled with the concept of creating a larger car that still handles and feels like a car with its badge should. This one, though, we think, strikes a good balance. No, it doesn't feel quite as sharp and frisky as the five-door hatch model to drive, but then most potential buyers in the targeted Focus family hatch segment will probably think that's a good thing. Not many customers in this class would want the famous mini go-kart style feel, and they certainly wouldn't want that jiggly ride that has previously tended to characterise models from this mark. You don't get that here because there's a far more sophisticated suspension system than the brand has ever offered us before. One using a multi-link rear setup that's only found on a handful of other models in the family hatchback sector. The result is a more forgiving and compliant standard of ride that'll be a revelation to anyone who was familiar with the first generation version of this car. Whether you think that this has come at the expense of uh, the kind of friskiness any Mini should offer you will depend on your perspective. Um, try this club and fresh from throwing a little Mini hatch through a set of your favourite bends and it's inevitably going to feel a bit softer and lazier. <laughs> of course it will, it's a larger and heavier car. Drive this model after ownership familiarity with an Astra, a Golf or just about any other car in this segment though and we'll think you'll consider it crisp, sharp and yes, fun. 
Aside from a Ford Focus, no other contender in this class can reward like this. Of course, you can't have everything. This Clubman's larger size will make it a touch less wieldy around town than you might expect a Mini to be. The turning circle, for example, has risen from the 11-metre reading you get in a Mini 5-door hatch to 11.3 metres here. Still, we'll take that in return for the improved ride quality, something complemented by impressive refinement that would be even better if Mini could find a way of keeping tyre roar down. Not that you'll notice this when you're enjoying yourself in this car, hunkering down in the low set seat and testing out the impressive reserves of traction. Body roll through the bends is well controlled and though the steering doesn't have the direct darty feel that you get in a mini hatch, it still feels enough to make you feel confident in what's beneath you. Of course, it'll help if you're able to spec your car up with the features that allow you to tailor its response to suit the kind of driving that you want to do. The starting point here is the optional mini driving mode system, one of those that tweaks throttle response, steering feel, stability control thresholds, and on auto gearbox models, gear shift timings to suit the way that you want to drive. Via this rather hidden selector at the base of the gear stick, there's a standard mid setting and a frugally orientated green mode, plus a third sport option for when the road opens up and the red mist begins to fall. Something appropriately echoed by the red glow around the central display and less subtly by a picture of a clubman thinking of a rocket and a go-kart. If you can uh, go further and also add into your car the additional option of variable damper control, you'll be able to tailor ride quality to suit your mood. Time to talk about engines, another area in which this clubman has shown signs of its more grown-up approach. Instead of the 1.6 litre units we've grown used to Mini offering, the range is predominantly based around twin power turbo power plants, predominantly two litres in size. Uh, maybe like us, you can't quite get used to the idea of an engine that big in a Mini, but the package seems to work well enough, especially in the 150 brake horsepower Cooper D diesel guys that we're trying here. With a healthy 330 newton meters overtaking punch is readily available and 62 miles an hour occupies only around 8.5 seconds en route to 132 miles an hour if you're quick with a rather notchy six-speed manual gearbox that we're trying here. We think this variant represents the sweet spot in the range, but if you really think it's not quick enough, then the healthy premium required to upgrade to the Cooper SD model gets you 190 brake horsepower, 400 newton meters of torque, and an improvement of those figures to 7.4 seconds and 140 miles an hour. Of course, you may be one of those not necessarily wedded to the idea of black pump motoring, and if so, your mini dealer will want you to peruse the various petrol options. Ideally, of course, you'd want the storming John Cooper Works performance model, but realistically, the 192 brake horsepower Cooper S variant offers you very similar speed from a much the same 2-litre turbo engine. 62 miles an hour here achievable in 7.2 seconds en route to 142 miles an hour in the manual model. As with the Cooper diesel variants, they're the option of ordering this car with 8-speed automatic transmission and a set of steering wheel paddles, a package that won't harm your running cost efficiency and will probably improve it. We should finish by pointing out that not all models in the range feature large 2.0-litre engines. The entry-level petrol Cooper variant uses the smaller Mini Hatch's 1.5-litre three-cylinder unit, an engine you might feel could be out of its depth hauling along nearly 1.4 tonnes of Clubman. Actually, there's little need for concern. This unit happily copes with a heavier BMW 318i, so it's quite willing enough to deal with this installation, making 62 miles an hour in uh, 9.1 seconds en route to 127 miles an hour. That being the kind of performance you get from a Pokia 1.4 litre turbo Golf or Astra. Here it's worth mentioning that the automatic gearbox option is the brand's older six-speed Steptronic unit. Whatever your transmission or engine choice though, you'll get a car that feels like it's made by people who enjoy their driving. In other words, it's a proper Mini. Thank goodness. There's no disputing that from the outside, the Clubman still looks like a Mini, even though it's quite a substantial thing, almost identical in height and width to a Volkswagen Golf or Ford Focus. 
Now, if you're comparing against the Mini's five-door hatch, this car is 270 millimetres longer and 73 millimetres wider, which makes a difference in size between the two models as great as it is between a Focus and a Fiesta. As for the styling, well, most seem to think that, if anything, this Clubman's stretched dimensions actually improve these slightly awkward aesthetics that you uh, get on smaller mini hatch models. Let's see if you agree. Inevitably, it's impossible with this car to discuss that subject without mentioning doors, specifically the twin door arrangement here at the rear that's supposed to hark back to the Austin 7 Countryman. We'll get to whether there's actually any benefit in having six doors on your family hatchback in a minute. But to begin with, in discussing this club, and let's consider what really makes it a mini. Familiar company touches include short overhangs and a wide track, while here at the front, there's a clamshell bonnet with a sculpted power dome that sits below an upright windscreen. As usual with the brand, these chrome-trimmed circular headlamps provide perhaps the most distinctive exterior feature. These days offering the option of full LED technology and incorporating arched turn indicators and an LED daylight driving ring. In this uh, modern era, this hexagonal grille is a classic mini feature too, divided by a bumper trim finished in high gloss black and positioned above a wide lower air inlet flanked by optional LED front fog lights. In profile, the Clubman's distinctive silhouette is equally mini-like, with this continuous band of chrome at the base of the glass house, these uh, blacked-out pillars that create the so-called floating roof, and the option of a contrasting colour for the roof and the mirror surrounds. All of it's present and correct, along with a smarter design for familiar side scuttle side indicator surrounds, and the usual black periphery around the bottom edge of the bodywork. There are lovely extra touches too, like this useful LED flashing light on top of the shark fin antenna that shows when the vehicle's locked and helps to locate it in a busy car park. At the rear, the vertically stacked tail lights of other minis are replaced by these horizontal lamps that aim to provide extra visual width. But if you're a potential Clubman buyer, there'll be only one focus for your attention when it comes to first acquaintance with this part of the car. These distinctive side-hinged split rear so-called club doors mark this model out from any other on the road. They open via this dual-section chrome handle or with the optional comfort access feature fitted by waving your foot beneath the bumper if, key in pocket, you approach the car laden down with bags. Now, whatever form of opening you use, the right-hand door springs open first, and once open, the left-hand door can be opened in a similar fashion. You even get useful cubby compartments built into the door trim. In fact, the only real downside to this arrangement is that you have to remember to leave at least 530 millimetres behind your clubman when parking, otherwise you won't be able to open anything up. Inside, you'll find 360 litres of luggage capacity, or at least you will, provided you don't eat up some of the space available with an optional spare wheel. We suggest that the run-flat tyres we have fitted here are a better alternative to the standard tyre repair kit. In truth, the room on offer here is a bit below what you could expect from most other cars in the family hatchback C segment, but Mini is still quick to declare it class competitive on the basis that there's 44 litres more room here than you get in a Ford Focus and only 20 litres less than is provided by a Golf. It's certainly in a different league from the mere 278-litre cargo area provided by a Mini 5-door hatch or the 260-litre figure of the previous generation Mini Clubman. To make the most of what's on offer, you'll need what Mini calls a storage compartment pack, which unfortunately doesn't come as standard. This gives you a variable height low compartment floor, tie-down hooks and a 12-volt socket, along with luggage nets for the front footwell and the boot floor to stop uh, smaller items from rolling around. That package also includes the option to push the rear seat back into a more upright cargo position should you be struggling to shut these rear doors. Another important extra cost option is the through loading system, which replaces the usual 60 40 split folding rear bench with a 40 20 40 folding backrest that allows you to poke uh, through longer items like skis between two seated rear passengers. If that's not enough, then flattening the rear bench frees up more space than any mini model to date. 1,250 litres, in fact. 
Enough on practicality, time to move up front. Here there'll be a conflicting mix of impressions for those familiar with modern minis, thanks to design that's different yet somehow still the same. Uh, we'll start with what's changed, namely an interior that's more discreet and formal looking than that of an ordinary mini hatch. It's much more spacious too, thanks to an extra 73 millimetres of cabin width. Features like decent door armrests and a centre console that, for the first time on a Mini, extends up to the instrument panel make it feel more grown up in here. In fact, you might even talk of a BMW style feel, were it not for familiar Mini touches like these column mounted dials, the row of toggle switches below the ventilation controls, the personalisable interior light colours and, most familiar of all, this huge circular display that crowns the centre stack. Ah yes, the central dash display. As ever in a modern MIDI, it's still dinner plate sized, but these days it doesn't house an almost indecipherable speedometer. That has been relocated to a pod above the steering wheel where it's flanked with the crescent moon rev counter. All of this has freed this central area up for much more infotainment trickery, marshalled via a 6.5 inch colour display that in this case has been upgraded to a larger 8.8 .8 inch screen in order to better show off the functionality of the extra cost media pack with its useful mini connected XL options. These build on the usual information, DAB stereo and Bluetooth phone functions by adding in 3D mapping for the standard navigation system, a jukebox and the various mini connected online services. Although crying out for touchscreen functionality, the colour layouts are actually marshalled by this classy, effective iDrive style controller touchpad dial down by the electronic handbrake. It's all very impressive, particularly if you make full use of the Mini Connected XL Systems downloadable JourneyMate app. Now this enables you to plan journeys on your smartphone, checking the weather and setting reminders that can flash up on the central screen as you drive, along with information on local fuel stations, parking spaces and traffic reports. Another feature of this display is the way that LED perimeter lights around its edge progressively illuminate as you switch driving modes or engage the engine stop start, cope with parking or count down to next sat nav turn off. If that's a bit too distinctively mini for you, then you probably won't like the scattering of more overt branded touches throughout the cabin. The way the start-stop central toggle tab features a heartbeat illumination which pulses before the engine started probably won't bother you too much. But if you've paid extra for the mini driving mode system and twist this rather cheap feeling collar tab at the base of the gear stick to select the setup sport mode, a graphic flashes up on the central screen showing a clubman thinking of a rocket and a go-kart. Worse, activate the vehicle and surroundings part of the rather cringily named driving excitement section of this display and you get a series of tick list graphics that show things like missiles flying from the engine bay and the car itself wearing a giant pair of sunglasses. To be frank, it's a bit, well, naff. But not much else about this cabin is. There's plenty of storage space with a big glove box and tartan lined door bins big enough for proper bottles. That centre console has a space for a storage area. There's a full-sized centre cubby armrest with an optional integrated phone compartment and a deep space below. Plus there are two cup holders ahead of the gear stick. Best of all, you get these impressively supportive seats that for the first time on any Mini can optionally feature full electric adjustment. Even without that, it's easy to get comfortable in front of the three-spoke leather-trimmed reach and rake adjustable multifunction steering wheel, through which you view the main instrument dial with its rather crowded speed designations. All-round visibility is fine, and oh, the shoulder vision better than we thought it might be, once you get over the way that the central rear door seam impedes your view out of the rear view mirror. Time to take a seat in the rear, an area of the car you can access from either side this time around. Incredibly, the first generation version of this model had only one rear side door, and even worse, positioned it on the right hand side of the car in right hand drive markets, meaning that backseat passengers had to get out into the middle of the road. 
there's none of that kind of stupidity this time around. Despite the fact that this car rides on the same UKL platform that's used for many smaller cars. Fortunately, it's been stretched here so that it can underpin not only this Clubman, but also BMW's mechanically identical 2 Series Active Tourer. While that model's marketed as a five-seat MPV, this one has a rather more compact remit. Although these wide-opening doors offer the promise of a more spacious cabin than you might expect. You have to watch your head getting in as the angle of the door aperture intrudes a little. But once inside, it's very un-mini-like and a big improvement on the rather cramped conditions offered by the previous generation version and the brand's five-door hatch. Don't get us wrong, there's not quite as much room here as you would have in, say, a Focus or a Golf, but the difference isn't significant enough to be a deal-breaker for most likely buyers. No, you can't comfortably seat three adults across this rear bench, but then, well, very few family hatchbacks can. Perhaps of more importance is that the seat cushions are a little hard and slightly short, but if you can adjust to that, then we'd say that there's quite acceptable standards of space for a car of this class. The fact that a six-footer can easily sit behind a front seat passenger of the same height, well, that seems revolutionary in a minute. Mini isn't troubling to address the budget end of the family hatchback segment here. Instead, targeting this second generation Clubman at Volkswagen's Golf and better specified mainstream Focus or Astra models in this sector. That means pricing in the 20 to 25,000 pound bracket. Here we've been trying the volume 2 litre diesel Cooper D version, which at the launch of this car was the least expensive diesel variant you could have. We reckon that it's the one to go for, offering punchy 150 brake horsepower performance at a premium of around £2,300 over the 1.5 litre petrol powered base Cooper derivative. If you do want to go faster, you'll need around £23,000 for the potent petrol powered Cooper S and getting on for £25,000 for the top diesel. The 190 brake horsepower Cooper SD. Across the range there are auto gearbox options, primarily BMW's 8-speed automatic that works with 2-litre models like this Cooper D and costs around £1,600 more. Ask for an auto on the base 3-cylinder petrol Cooper derivative though and you'll have to have the older 6-speed Steptronic transmission that'll cost you around £1,500 more. In looking at the value proposition all of this represents, we should probably start from a mini perspective. The brand is keen that this Clubman is seen as a different proposition from its five-door Countryman model, which is fair enough given the way that that car is increasingly being pitched as one of those Nissan Qashqai-style crossovers. As usual, it comes down to what you want. If you do want to make a Clubman versus Countryman comparison, then you'll ultimately end up discovering that price-wise, there's not a lot in it between the two cars. That's once you've matched comparable engines and raised Countryman model equipment levels to equal the higher standard spec of an equivalent Clubman. Comparing against a mini five-door hatch is a little less complicated, provided that you bear in mind that at Cooper D level, this Clubman gives you a much more powerful engine. Ultimately, you're looking at a difference between the two cars that varies from just over £2,000 to just under £4,000, depending on the variant you're looking at. We think that sounds reasonable, given this club and model's significant advantages in space and equipment. Perhaps a more instructive comparison, though, lies in pitching this car against its design stablemate, BMW's mechanically almost identical 2 Series Active Tourer. Yes, the BMW's a bit more spacious, but you're looking at a price difference between the two cars of three to £4,000 in Mini's favour. That's an awfully big premium in this part of the market. Actually, another identically engined BMW, the 1 Series Sports Hatch, is closer to this Clubman in terms of price and space. This Mini only undercuts one of those by around £1,500. Anyway, enough with the BMW Group comparisons. Mini's objective here is that this Clubman model should be able to credibly compete in the wider family hatchback market, or at least the upper end of it, as targeted by the reasonably powerful Cooper models that the brand is concentrating on selling in our market. You won't find credible competition for these if you're looking at family hatchbacks like Toyota's Auris, Citroen C4, uh, Kia's Seed or Hyundai's i30, all cars primarily based around more feebly powered engines. 
As for cars in this segment that could compete, well, the value choice would be a comparably engined Vauxhall Astra, which could save you up to £4,000. You'd save around half that amount by choosing a comparable Peugeot 308, a Mazda 3, Renault Megane or Honda Civic. And maybe a little less than that by choosing a comparable Skoda Octavia. Your mini salesperson, though, will be quick to point out that all these are rather boring choices compared to the fun that you and your family would get from owning a mini Clubman. But there is something in that. That same salesperson might also point out that a Ford Focus, a Volkswagen Golf or even a Seat Leon with the performance to match this Mini wouldn't actually save you any money at all, especially once this car's high equipment levels have been factored in. We also think that likely Clubman buyers are people who may possibly be considering more interesting and stylish family hatchback alternatives. Cars like the Alfa Romeo Giulietta, the Citroen-derived DS4 and maybe also Volvo's V40. All of these are priced similarly to this car but are noticeably less practical. If, having considered all of this, you conclude that it is a Mini Clubman that you really want, what can you expect to find included before it's necessary to resort to the brand's notoriously long options list? Well, let's see. All models get alloy wheels of at least 16 inches in size, front fog lights, an alarm and auto headlamps and wipers. Plus, there's the advantages of the Mini Excitement package, which features extended LED interior lighting and a projection of the brand logo on the ground beneath the driver's side door mirror when the door is opened or closed. Inside, there's air conditioning, Bluetooth phone connectivity, cruise control with a braking function, a three-spoke leather multifunction steering wheel, a trip computer and a 6.5-inch central infotainment screen display with an LED ring via which you can access a DAB stereo system and the standard mini navigation setup. From there on in, it's down to the level of restraint you can bring to bear on the tempting accessories list. We think you probably need the storage compartment pack, which gives you the variable height load compartment floor, as well as little detail touches like luggage nets for the boot and the front passenger footwell, uh, a cargo position for the rear seat back, a front center armrest, and in the boot area, tie down hooks and a 12 volt socket. You already get this package included in the chili pack that the majority of Clubman customers choose. It's fitted here and adds a whole range of desirable touches. Things like larger 17 or 18 inch wheels, LED technology for the headlights and the front fog lamps, rear parking sensors and a comfort access system that gives you keyless access to the car and allows you to open the rear doors by waving your foot beneath the bumper. Inside, the chili pack adds cloth and leather seat trim, front heated sports seats, plus climate control and the mini driving mode system that enables you to select between mid, sport or green settings, depending on how efficient you want your journey to be. That driving mode system can be specified separately and is well worth having, able to allow you to tweak uh, steering, throttle and on auto transmission models, gear change response to suit the way you want to drive. For a little more, the same settings can also enable you to alter ride quality via Mini's clever variable damper control system. This is definitely a better option than the rather over-firm optional sport suspension. Other niceties include an upgraded Harman Kardon stereo system, a glass panoramic roof, windscreen heating, an auto-dimming rear view mirror, electric seat adjustment, full leather seat trim and power folding mirrors. There's also a park distance control system that'll even better guide you into the tightest spaces if you additionally add in a rear parking camera. Maybe you'll also tick the box for the head-up display that's found on a little panel that rises at the base of the windscreen. In terms of practical stuff, well, we'd want this car's through loading system that gives you a rear seat centre armrest courtesy of a 40-20-40 seatback split that enables longer items like skis to be poked through from the cargo area. And we'd be ticking the box for this car's run-flat tyres, probably a better option than the extra-cost spare wheel that would take up space in the boot. You could also specify a roof box and perhaps, if family commitments call, a mini junior child seat or two. It's also worth knowing that on a Clubman, you can get the optional tow bar that isn't available on Mini's five-door hatch model. That'll be important for buyers wanting to hitch up a small trailer that'll take their scrambles bike or go-kart, or maybe just their rubbish to the dump. As for aesthetic niceties, well, there are countless ways to personalise the look of this Mini. 
To mention just a few, the chili pack mentioned earlier can be specified in a John Cooper Works form that gives you an aggressive body kit and all kinds of sporty interior touches, including a lovely John Cooper Works sports steering wheel. If you don't want to go that far, then you could add a rear spoiler or get the roof and the mirror caps of your clubman finished in silver, as here. A set of grippy John Cooper Works sports seats might be nice. And we'd also like the mini yours interior styles option, where the door trim design is highlighted via illuminated decorative strips, with this car in a pure burgundy colour. Finally, there's the option to specify alloy wheels up to 19 inches in size, although these will inevitably affect ride quality. Don't go too far in terms of spending on niceties like these, though, without fully considering the range of mini-connected services that come packaged up either in standard form or in the more advanced mini-connected XL guys. These systems allow you to seamlessly integrate smartphones, so enabling the use of internet-based services for entertainment, communication and driver information. There's networked navigation and real-time traffic information too, thanks to the XL package's clever journeymate function. Mini Connected is the way into online-based services such as web radio and the use of social networks like Facebook, Twitter, Foursquare and Glimpse. It'll also be the way you'll be receiving RSS news feeds and entertainment features such as Deezer, Napster and TuneIn. Now, if you like the sound of all this, then opting for the media pack that we've been trying here gives you it all packaged into a larger 8.8-inch screen, along with voice control, 3D mapping, a 20-gigabyte jukebox hard drive and a mini controller with a touchpad. On to safety and a level of possible provision that seems an awful long way from model founder Alec Isagoni's original thoughts on the subject back in the 60s. Asked about the crash worthiness of a Mini, he said, I make my cars with such good brakes and such good steering that if people get into a crash, it's their own fault. Now, thankfully, things have progressed a bit in the safety department since then. There are anti-lock brakes, of course, with electronic brake force distribution to make them more effective and cornering brake control to help you through the turns. So you're always primed for a swift stop. There's tyre pressure monitoring, fading brake support and a clever brake drying function that will imperceptibly dap the discs in wet weather to keep them dry. There's also the usual stability control system and a DTC dynamic traction control setup that in poor conditions will allow a bit of controlled slip at the drive wheels so moving away on loose sand or deep snow can be a little smoother. If all of that isn't enough to avoid an accident, then Isofix child seat fastenings, a pedestrian friendly bonnet and twin front side and curtain airbags will all be welcome features. In going further, your first option is to tick the box for the driving assistant pack I have here, based around a camera-operated cruise control and distance control function that's said to automatically maintain a predetermined distance to the vehicle ahead. It'll also dip your high beam for you at night and display road signs on the dash as you pass them. Best of all, a clever collision and pedestrian warning system is included that scans the road ahead for potential accident hazards. If one's detected, you'll be warned. If you don't respond, or you aren't able to, then the brakes will automatically be applied to decrease the severity of any resulting accident. Another smart idea is the optional e-call intelligent emergency calling system. In the event of an accident, this setup automatically detects the vehicle location and accident severity before contacting a call centre to initiate fast and effective assistance. Now, that could be a lifesaver. We suspect, though, that the good Sir Alec would have hated it. Small mini efficiency, big mini space. It's a difficult balance to achieve, especially in a compact car mostly powered by large two liter engines. Can this clubman achieve it? Well, that's what's necessary if it's to credibly take on segment leading focus class family hatchbacks. A difficult job given that this second generation model weighs in at nearly 1.4 tons, around 230 kilograms more than its predecessor. To get the job done, the brand is relying on its usual minimalism technologies. Things like brake energy regeneration, active cooling air flaps, the reduction of engine and transmission internal frictional losses, and ancillary engine systems that operate only one cord upon, rather than constantly pumping away in the background. 
Plus, of course, there's a stop-start system to cut the engine when you don't need it, when you're stuck in traffic or waiting at the lights. Automatic models can also work with the mini navigation system to take account of your selected route and better control your gear shifts to suit. Of course, the driver needs to play his or her part too. There's a shift point display so you can optimally time your gear changes, plus there are various extra cost systems you can add that should further help to drive your running costs down. First up is the mini driving mode system I have here. It operates via use of this rotary switch at the base of the gear stick, allowing you to switch from a default mid mode to self-expansory sport or green settings. Green mode modifies throttle and transmission response and tweaks that gear shift point display. Also useful is a so-called coasting function, where at high cruising speeds the drivetrain is temporarily decoupled for extra frugality when you come off the accelerator. The onboard computer provides two readouts which demonstrate the effect of the fuel savings all of this creates. One that shows the extra mileage available and another that shows the reduced energy consumption. And finally, there's the minimalism analyzer that you can add as part of the mini connected media package. And that's there to score your driving and guide you towards more economic progress. It might initially seem to be a bit of a gimmick, but owners who've used it reckon on fuel economy improvements of between four and eight miles per gallon. But enough on the theory of it all. Just how efficient can this mini club and actually be in practice? Well, in entry-level three-cylinder petrol form, you might have high expectations here, and by and large, they are fulfilled, provided, that is, you realise that you're looking at a 1.4-tonne petrol-powered, 136-brake horsepower family car, capable of rest uh, 62 miles an hour in about nine seconds, and don't go comparing against something feebler and less capable. The base 1.5-litre petrol Cooper version I'm talking about manages 55.4 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 118 grams per kilometre of CO2. Uh, yes, that makes it about 10% pricier to run than a smaller mini five-door hatch model with the same engine, but it's a better return than you get from the kind of turbocharged 1.4-litre Volkswagen Golf or Vauxhall Astra that you'd have to have to equal this mini's performance. And the stats look even better if you spec this entry-level petrol club and when the optional six-speed Steptronic automatic transmission, as with that gearbox, the running costs are unaffected. So far, so good then. But just how minimalist can this club and model be with a great big two-litre engine installed up front, as is the case with the diesel-powered Cooper D variant we're trying here? Well, still pretty frugal is the answer. This manages uh, 68.9 miles per gallon on the combined cycle and 109 grams per kilometre of CO2 with either six-speed manual or eight-speed automatic transmission, which is pretty much exactly what you get from a comparable two-litre, 150 brake horsepower diesel Focus, Peugeot 308 or Volkswagen Golf. Opt for the Pokia Club and SD diesel and those figures fall to 62.8 miles per gallon and 119 grams per kilometre. Although you can improve those readings by about 5% if you specify your car with automatic transmission. An auto gearbox also improves the return of the petrol-powered Cooper S model. In manual transmission form, this variant manages 45.6 miles per gallon and 144 grams per kilometre of CO2. What else? Well, residual values are bound to be quite strong. The three-year retention figures you get with Mini models are always well above the class average. That'll also be helped by the way that Mini reliability improves with each generation, something evidenced by falling warranty claims. As expected, there's the usual three-year unlimited mileage warranty with the usual BMW-style variable service indicators. And on that subject, almost all Mini buyers opt for the no-brainer TLC package, which for around £350 gives you comprehensive servicing cover for five years or 50,000 miles, whichever is reached first. That's half the amount you might easily pay to service a rival Focus or Golf class car over the same period. And the deal also includes a mini MOT protect assurance guarantee stating that in the unlikely event that your car should fail its first, second or third MOT test, mini will cover the cost of repair or replacement on an array of selected parts. Finally, I should mention insurance groups. You're looking at uh, Group 17E for the petrol-powered Clubman Cooper model, Group 18E for this Cooper D diesel variant, and Group 22E for the petrol Cooper S model.
This Clubman must have been a difficult car to design. If not quirky and interesting, it would lose the support of traditional mini buyers needing something a little larger. Make this Clubman too mini-testic, though, and it wouldn't be able to reach out to Focus and Golf segment buyers wanting something a little more individual. Given such an awkward brief, you have to admire the results achieved here. This is certainly the brand's most practical car to date, yet it never forgets it's a Mini, with a sense of fun that's missing from more conventional rivals. Which is impressive, given the dour sensibility of the BMW 2 Series Active Tourer underpinnings that this car rides upon. As we've said, there isn't quite the lively chuckability you get in a smaller mini hatch, but compensations come with much better ride quality and far superior levels of refinement. While this car can't match, say, uh, a Golf in that regard, it gets closer to that benchmark than you'd think a Mini ever could. In summary, if you need a practical car from this brand and find the hatch five-door model too small and the Countryman crossover too quirky, then Clubman ownership could be tempting. Forget the compromised and poorly executed first-generation version of this car. This Mark II model is a very different proposition. Some other family hatches still offer a little more practicality, but there's no doubt that the prospect of going club class and enjoying this car's eager uniqueness will seem very appealing to many of the new buyers Mini is seeking to target. Of course, Clubman customers must still be people unafraid to fly in the face of convention. If that's you, though, then a bigger Mini adventure beckons. <laughs>